Welcome to Butterfly Effect, La Vuelta, España, the Tour of Spain, Stage 8, 2020. Okay, great stage, a great stage for me to break down on some tactics that you might have missed throughout the race. Okay, wasn't that exciting of a stage, break gets away, tempo by Inos. What Inos is trying to do, they want to set the tempo at a distance where they don't have to really worry about bringing the break back. But they're also hoping someone like Mobistar will go to the front and ride the last 50K for them, which is the scenario we saw today. Before the final climb, 50K or something like that, from the final start of the final climb, Mobistar jump on the front on the second to last climb and drill it. It's their tactic 101 with Mobistar. They use it all the time. They want to try to win the stage. They also don't want to increase the pace till they actually get on a climb so they can hurt a lot of people and make people suffer. So as soon as the second to last climb starts, somewhere 40, 50K, I can't remember what the distance was from the, from the, final of, from the start of the last climb, but they're drilling it there on purpose just to put the hurt on the riders. Inos are planning this tactic. That's why they leave the gap at that distance so Inos can save the legs and not have to ride very hard to the finish, the last 40K, or another team has to get on the front like Movistar did and do the work for them. So Movistar goes to the front. Here's the problem Movistar always makes. They love being aggressive. They like trying to win everything with force. They like getting on the mountain stages. They like putting guys in the break. They like burning matches all over the place. Now you say, Chris, well, they won stage two. Stage two was almost the summit finish. Not quite a summit finish. That's the difference between stage two and stage eight. One's a summit finish, one isn't. When you don't have a summit finish, but you have a climb very close to the finish like they had on stage two, and you have perfect numbers, and you can out, out maneuver tactically the rest of the group like they did on stage two with Mark Soler when he jumped away. Yumbo Visma, remember, they went up stage two. Sepp Kuss put the hurt on everybody, blew it, blew it apart. There was only left with Primoz Roglic and himself to cover six, seven, eight guys, whatever the number was. Mark Soler jumps. They don't have enough guys to chase him from behind. He wins the stage. Now, this on paper starts making people think like, oh, Mobistar's the number one team. They got great numbers. They had more numbers in the break than anyone else. They can win anything. So when they hop on the front on a stage like today, even in their mind, in their director's mind, they're thinking, we got three in the top 10. We got Enric Maas here. We dropped Primoz Roglic earlier a few stages ago. Okay, you dropped him because he had a rain jacket issue. His team chased for 20K. He did a solo bridge across to a Mobistar-led team time trial team. He was tied, tired legs on the last climb. That's why you dropped him. You didn't drop him because you outclimbed him. You dropped him because of they made some mistakes. His legs were tired, and then you dropped him. Now you fast forward to a stage like today. Rolex has had a rest day. He's had other days to sit on with the group. His legs are coming back around. You have a summit finish. Mobistar is riding hard. I like the part where they ride hard on the second to last climb. I like the part where they bring the brake back. What I don't like about their tactics, when you get on a summit finish, especially one as difficult and as steep as today, and you don't have the best climber, i.e. you don't have Richard Carapaz, you don't have Primoz Roglic. You don't have Hugh Carthy. You don't have Dan Martin. Those are the four best pure climbers in the race. When you're on a steep, steep climb like this, nothing outperforms pure power. There's a little bit of tactic being played, of course. There always will be. Nothing, nothing can erase some tactics. But pure power on something really steep like today's climb is the number one advantage you want. And Primoz Roglic has it. Carapaz has it, Dan Martin's pretty good at it, and Hugh Carthy's pretty good at it. Enric Moss, next in line. So there's four guys in front of you. Four guys aren't going to make a mistake. So they go into the climb. The biggest problem they had is they drilled it at the bottom of the climb. You don't want to drill it at the bottom of the climb. You want to keep it going slower so that you can win with tactical numbers. The slower it goes, the better chance you have for Alejandro Valverde, stage two winner, Mark Soler, can do some works of magic and hope that he gets a gap and guys play a tactical game behind and he wins. That's what all three of those riders need. Alejandro Valverde, Mark Soler, and Enric Moss all need some tactics being played in the back, some hesitation in order to win. Instead, they reach the last climb. They drill it as hard as they can. 
allowing both the EF education riders with Woodsy and Hugh Carthy to sit on and get a fresh ride and the whole Yumbo team behind them getting a fresh ride, plus the Enos guys with Amador and Richard Carapaz getting a free ride. While they're hurting the pace, setting it so hard that their three leaders aren't going to have the energy to first get that initial gap and hope for tactics to be played. So Mobistar were great, bringing it back, giving a chance to win the stage, but then they're absolutely catastrophic and drilling the pace at the bottom of the climb because they don't have the best climbers. They have to win with tactics. The slower the race goes at the finish, the better numbers they have and the better chance they can win with tactics. When you see the climb like today, it's brute force all the way to the top and then it's game over for Mobistar. Okay, behind, 5K to go. Mobistar's drilling in the climb. They bring it up to 5K to go. It's Woods, Michael Woods on the front for Hugh Carthy drilling it as hard as he can then pulling off Hugh Carthy jumps and when Hugh Carthy jumps it's a great tactic he jumps at about three and a half k to go Sepp Kuss the amazing American kid jumps right on his wheel I cannot stress when you look at how many days and how many times Jumbo Visma have used up his energy in stages earlier today had he had that freshness today his legs might have been even better and he might have been able to solo for the win, okay? Instead, he can follow Hugh Carthy. Amazing ride from Sepp. He follows Hugh. He stays on his wheel. Hugh Carthy's tactic, I can agree with. He's hoping, he's hoping for a little bit of tactics behind from Richard Carapaz and Primoz Roglic, trying to play cat and mouse with each other, get that little gap, and hold it to the line. He is one. Hugh Carthy is one of the best climbers in this race. It's a great tactic. Jump away. Hope, little fingers crossed for a little bit of hesitation, he can win the stage. He doesn't because Richard Carapaz is on very good form. Better than we saw at the 2020 Tour de France. We saw it on stage two. He looked comfortable on those, those stages. He also looked comfortable on the rainy stage when Roglic lost his jacket when it, and Richard Carapaz takes the red jersey. Now we're going to see a fair fight, though, between Roglic and Carapaz on this climb. And Roglic has the advantage because he can follow the red jersey wherever he wants, whenever he wants. So Richard Carapaz closes the gap finally and shuts it down for the Hugh Carthy move. After that, Dan Martin puts in a little bit of a dig, but it's covered quite quickly. And now we start going under 1K. Primoz Roglic puts in a great dig. Looks like he might actually be able to win this stage. Carapaz follows and directly puts in another move. That shows that these two riders on, are on pretty close to even form. What Primoz Roglic has over all the other riders, he has this ability to go 1K to the line at an extreme top level of pain and suffering. Most mere mortals like myself when I was racing, I could do 200, 300 meters of the final, but I couldn't do 1K. What Primoz Roglic is doing during that whole 1K effort is very impressive. He's doing a max effort he only needs a few pedal strokes to recover. He can do another max effort, a few pedal strokes to recover, and then a max effort all the way to the line for five, 600 meters. His last attack on Richard Carapaz was somewhere around 800 meters ago, and he basically held that all the way to the line with just some brief easing of the pedal and then followed by another ex ex big, big acceleration. Roglic was absolutely impressive today on what he did. And this is why on the other stages of the butterfly effect, I had problems with the way Yumbo Visma were racing. When you have a rider like Roglic and he only lost time because of a rain jacket issue and now he's still only 30 seconds behind, there's no reason to change plan A. Plan A in my book is always when you're race leader in a grand tour. Just because he lost 30 seconds, you don't change plan A. You don't start sending all your favorite super domestiques up in the break like they did earlier. You save them because you know Primoz Roglic will have the jersey again at some point in time in this Vuelta and he's gonna need those super domestiques around him. Now we got a great race to watch between Richard Carapaz and Primoz Roglic. I think we're gonna see a lot of action there. Jumbo Visma were fantastic on their job today. They really did everything correct. It was, it was picture perfect, plan A. They went back to plan A and it worked out nicely. Inos, man, they were beautiful. They really were. They rode the first part easy. They left the gap there for Mobistar to do the rest, so they got to sit on for that 40, 50K to the final climb, and then they let Mobistar blow it all up. They followed the EF education guys, and then it was Richard Carapaz battling with Primoz Roglic. 
No one can decide that. Those two have to decide it. It was perfect racing from Ineos. I loved it all the way around. Movistar, again, just being too aggressive. Hopefully you enjoyed how I broke it down for you and why stage two was so impressive from Movistar, but why today at stage eight, of course, doesn't have the same outcome, even though everybody talking about how strong their team is with three guys in the top 10. Doesn't matter if you got three guys in the top 10. They still need tactics to, tactics to win, and they employed the wrong tactics on today's finishing climb. Now let's talk about the jersey. 2004 World Championships. I went in there with the USA national team and with two corners to go in the race. Well, first, let's go back to, we go up the climb. Big circuit in Verona. It's the second time I had done the World Championships in Verona. Oscar Freire won the first time. He'd won another World Championships as number two, and now he's going for number three in Verona. When we went up the last climb, I'd gotten dropped from the front group, but I stayed with Eric Zabel's German national team the whole time. I knew they would set pace to bring them back to the front group. They drill it over the top. We're off the back at the top. They drill it over the top, down the descent, along the flats, and we catch with about 5K to go to the finish. Because it's a circuit, I knew the last two corners to the finish. Racing from the U.S., I was really good at doing criteriums and fighting for position, and I know where to be when the sprint starts. So I come around the outside on the left turn as we go into the right turn. You'll see I'll just pass by Michael Bogart, and I'll take the wheel of Oscar Freire to start the sprint. I'm in a perfect position coming down the straightaway to win the World Championships. The only problem is I'm not a sprinter. I'm never going to win the World Championships in a sprint. But I'm in the perfect position if I was a sprinter. Of course, I'm not. Now what happens is I have uh, Oscar Freire's wheel there right when he starts to jump to do the sprint. The Germans lead it out on the left side, I'm on the right. They take off, Oscar Freire jumps. As soon as he jumps, I jump and my, skein, and my chain skips on the back derailleur and I instantly lose two, two, three spaces right there at the World Championships with just a few hundred meters to go. I was devastated, was never going to win. End up finishing eighth. I think I was the, probably the last. That might have been the last time a U.S. rider was top ten at the World Championships. But I keep looking at it thinking I could have been fifth. I never believe I could have won. The sprinters would have always come by me. But if I could have just not had that chain skip and held Oscar Freire's wheel, I would have been top five, which would have been a fun result. It's always first, top three, top five, top ten. So eighth is about the same as tenth to me. Anyways, it was a great experience. 2004, after that day, I signed with Sonier Duval Pordeur, and instead of coming back to the U.S. like I was originally planned, the Sonier Pordeur team picked me up, put me in an Italian hotel, and I spent the next two months there training to get ready for a tour of Lombardi, Perry Tours, and a couple of Italian classics. It was a great end to the 2004 season. Hope you enjoyed the butterfly effect and the tactics that I talked about on today's stage. Look forward to doing some more. Like and subscribe, and I'll see all you guys real soon tomorrow.